Christmas. Um, I've got the pleasure of doing the reading this evening because, um, uh, because uh, well, you'll find out when you hear the reading. Um, uh, Sam didn't want to give it to anyone else and because um, uh, it's quite, uh, it's basically, I'm going to read a long list of names to you. You up for it? Whoa! Who doesn't, who doesn't love a cheeky little genealogy in mid-December? Um, so, uh, strap in. Uh, and the, uh, Sam will make sense of why uh, we asked him to speak on this passage, um, and it will become clear. So, uh, is it on the screen? Yes. So our, verse, um, our reading for this evening is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez, and the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amimadab. (laughs) Amimadab. The father, thank you, uh, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon of skiwear fame. Salmon, uh, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. You've heard of him. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother, ha- whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jerim. Uh, Jerim, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Azar. Azar, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, we are halfway through. Hezekiah, the father of Manesh. Manesh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. And his brothers, I didn't read the second half of this reading. And his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile, a bunch of homeboys came out the woodwork. And I'm not going to read all of their names until we get to Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. This was more or less the word of the Lord. Yeah, let's give John a round of applause for getting through that. Um, Just to clarify, John, are we saying genealogy or genealogy? Genealogy. I thought that was the case. I'm just glad we're clarifying that. Um, What a corker of a verse. Thanks for giving it to me, John. Um, The beginning of the New Testament, the first of the four Gospels, the story of the life of Jesus and his ministry begins with the genealogy of Jesus. Genealogy genealogy, um, isn't a term that is used that often today, or at least not that often. So I thought it'd be helpful just to start with just a little bit of context and some background to genealogy and what it's defined as. It's defined as a line of descent traced continuously from an ancestor. I don't know what that definition sparks up in you. A line of descent traced continuously from an ancestor. I don't know, has anyone's family, or probably more specifically, a great aunt or great grandma or something along those lines done your family's family tree? Anyone's hands up for that? A few people. And then when it comes to Christmas, they decide that is the perfect time to bore the life out of everybody and go into a deep dive of your family's history. Anyone else relate to that? Yeah, a few people. Um, And as I was actually writing this and reading over it during the week, I, I... just heard Izzy's loud voice come from the living room going, you can tell everybody that I'm related to Elvis Presley. (laughs) A perfect example of something your grandma or great aunt would share at Christmas after one too many sherries. And if I'm totally honest, I used to feel this way when it came to the genealogy, when it came to these first pages of Matthew. I used to skip over them being like, get me to the juicy bits, get me to healings, the resurrection, get me to people coming to know Jesus, and just completely skip this first page. Again, anyone else relate? Oh, I don't think people would actually phone up to that. Come on, we've got an honest church. However, this was such a mistake. 
I couldn't have got this any more wrong because presenting the genealogy in this way was one of the most interesting ways that Matthew could begin the book for the Jewish audience of which he was writing to. What Matthew is trying to do here is show and prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the one the Jews had been waiting for generations for. He does this in verse 1, where he says, This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. By calling Jesus the son of Abraham, Matthew is connecting Jesus to the father of the people of Israel. So by linking Jesus to Abraham, Matthew is bringing the intention back to the promise of God's rescue plan for the world, which they had been waiting generations for. What does this have to do with Advent or Christmas? Well, Tim Keller describes it like this. He says, Christmas is the beginning of the news of God's coming to rescue us because we couldn't rescue ourselves. He then uses the term son of David, used a number of times in Matthew's gospel. And where the use of Abraham's name pointed towards the belonging amongst the people it was written for, the Jews, David's name tells us that Jesus was royalty. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. The birth of the King of Kings, Emmanuel, God with us. And so this evening, I want to reshape, well, I started by reshaping the way I looked at the genealogy and hopefully we can do the same for you. With these two points, number one, God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. And number two, there is a place for you in this story. So first point, God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. I am totally impatient, like seriously impatient. Izzy can agree with this. Any of my friends in the room can totally agree with that also. And the one place I think is the most infuriating place in Southampton is the queue in Zara. Like seriously, it is the slowest place on earth. Like, with a hands up if you've been stood in that queue for at least 10 minutes. Yeah, nobody should have to do that. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry if there's any staff of Zara in here this evening. I don't know what happens to the staff at the till. They just decide that life's better going slower. I don't know what happens to the people who are standing in the queue. It's as if life just stands still. And yes, I'm praying to God to work on my patience. Don't worry. But when we talk about patience, I kind of need to get over myself a little bit. There were centuries between the promise of Abraham and the fulfillment in the coming of Christ in a manger on Christmas Day. Like centuries. And what does the genealogy teach us on that? Again, Tim Keller says this, the genealogy teaches us that God may take his time, but he keeps his word. I love this bit. You cannot judge God by your calendar. You cannot judge God by your calendar. The Jewish people waited for centuries for the fulfillment, for the promise to be fulfilled. They were longing and waiting in anticipation. And in this room, I'm pretty sure we're all longing for something. We're all hoping and praying and waiting for something. That could be to answer a big prayer, to reveal what's next for you after university, what's the next career move. Or maybe God shared a vision or a dream with you that you're like, why hasn't this happened yet? Like, God, come on, what is going on? But as John shared a while ago, God is never late. He's very rarely early, but his timing is perfect and his way for your life is perfect. Okay, Sam, God is never late. He may, ne- he may take his time, but he always keeps his word. What the flipping heck does that mean? Like, it's not really that helpful, is it? Well, no, and not really. Well, at least when you're thinking, at, thinking about it from your own perspective, when you're thinking about it from your ways and your desires for your life. What I'm trying to say is that God's way for your life is not your way for your life. It's God's timing and not your own. God is working with the whole universe We are working with our own lives, our wants, our desires. And when we look at it from that perspective, of course we get frustrated. I get frustrated myself. 
but God is working with the whole universe. But when you put your faith in Jesus, you are choosing to trust God's timing when you put your faith in him. And when you do this, you are saying, I actually don't know what's best for my life. But you are choosing to have faith in God's timing, just like those who were waiting for centuries for the Messiah, waiting for God's rescue plan for the world. Is there a situation in your life where you need to hand over control and most importantly, have faith? Have faith that God is working in you and you need to simply trust him. Think for a moment. I'm just going to ask you to do something. Just close your eyes for a moment. Where in your life are you desperate to see God move? becoming impatient, becoming frustrated. Have faith that God is working in your life. Trust him. Ephesians 1.4 says this, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in sight. God knows and chose you before the creation of the world. That's how long we have been part of his plan. And when I was thinking about, I was drawn to um, the star that guided the wise men and the shepherds that night to Jesus. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the fact that as we leave church this evening and look up at the night sky, the stars that we see laying above us are 4,000 light years from us. So at most, we're seeing the stars as they appeared 4,000 years ago. That's a long time. It's longer than the Q and Zara. <laughs> God's God, right? He's the creator of the universe. He's alpha, omega, beginning and end. If he wanted to, he could have just gone, boom, have that. Here's a massive star in the night sky. Send some angels, shepherds, wise men, follow that big star, off you go. Or maybe is it completely unreasonable to suggest that he placed that star in the night sky since the beginning of creation? God's timing is perfect. He's never late. He's very rarely early. Had the star been in motion in his perfect timing, just like you have been before the creation of the world? Hear this tonight. God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. Do you need to trust him there? So God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. Second point. There is a place for you in this story. Before being um, an ordinand here at St. Mary's Church and before my time at Alpha over the last two years, I spent around three and a half years um, working in recruitment in different industries and different sectors. That was a close one, wasn't it? Um, But the real basis of what that means is I spent a lot of time sifting through people's CVs, looking for skills, looking for experiences, looking for things that are going to make people stand out, that are going to put them above other people to achieve more. That would be perfect for the role of which I was recruiting for. Just a quick one on that. Spell your name right on a CV or you're not getting an interview. But genuinely, during this time, your genealogy was seen and used as your resume, your CV, a LinkedIn page if you like, and you would have used it to impress others. And historically, your resume was your family. So before you had achieved anything or tried to achieve anything, you were judged on the success or the failures of your family. And if it came to a job application, considering the context of the time of which Matthew was writing in, he would not be helping Jesus get very far. Matthew lists those associated with potential sex scandals, Canaanites who were hostile tribes opposing the Israelites, prostitutes and Moabites who led the Israelites to worship other gods all associated with Israel's sin and failure of which God was coming to have to rescue us from. Matthew includes outsiders and outcasts of the culture. He included women who were gender outsiders. 
He included Gentiles who were racial outsiders. And he included great sinners who were moral outsiders. This shows that those excluded by culture can be included in God's family by his grace. It also shows that no matter your race, gender or sin, we are all equally sinful and lost, but we are equally accepted and loved, which leaves no room for superiority. Through his grace, there is a place for all in the Christmas and gospel story. We are all welcome. There is a place for me and there is a place for you. And when we approach life from this perspective, it leaves no room for superiority. This is sometimes described as the upside down kingdom of God and it's a theme that runs throughout Matthew's gospel. Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13.47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into a lake and caught all kinds of fish. The line of descent traced from Abraham to David to Jesus. Those named all the way to the beginning of God's promise, to the beginning of God's rescue plan for us at Christmas, to the teaching of Jesus that we find in Matthew's gospel teaches us that there is no superiority in the Christmas and gospel story. There are no outsiders. All are welcome. I've joked a little bit, but I also have one of those family members who love to bore the life out of everybody at Christmas. And my family tree goes all the way back into the fire of London, and I do actually find it fascinating. Um, I specifically geek out around 1939 to 45. I love World War II history. Little fun fact about me. But it's amazing. What I love to see is the, generational, or the generation of war veterans in my family, the generation of people serving in the police, Immigrants from Ireland way back finding a home in Scotland. However, there is this part of my genealogy. It's alcoholics, adulterers, gang members, drug users, and now a trainee vicar in the Church of England. Some of what I've just listed is far, far back in my genealogy. Some of it is 30, 20, even further, and some of it is really recent. And if I'm honest, I used to believe that a lot of what I look back at is what I used to think my current and what my future was going to look like. I used to use it as an excuse. Like, ah, my family struggle with alcohol. It's probably going to be my story. Did I used to think that I would have a healthy relationship with alcohol? No. Did I used to think that I wouldn't be tempted by drugs? If I'm honest, no. Did I think that I'd be doing a second degree and training to be a vicar in the Church of England? Absolutely not. And my story isn't your story. I'm not trying to say that. And my current isn't your current. But what changed it all for me and what I hope to remind you of this evening and what can change it all for you is knowing that new life is found in Jesus. Life to the full is found in Jesus. That new life starts at the end of this genealogy in the birth of Jesus. And what I want you to hear is that we are not held or defined by what has gone before us. God doesn't judge us by our genealogy, but nor is he ashamed by it. He uses it. Romans 8, 28, it says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of all those who love him. We have been called according to his, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Are you letting the mistakes of someone else's past shape who you are instead of trusting and knowing that there is new life on offer to you that starts with Jesus and that God uses all things, all family history, all mistakes, In the first 17 verses, we meet 46 people whose lifetimes span 2,000 years. All were ancestors of Jesus, but varied considerably in personality, spirituality, and experience. Some were heroes of the faith, like Abraham, Isaac, Ruth, David. 
Some had shadier reputations like Rahab and Tamar. But many were very ordinary. There were also others who were evil. But the good news that starts in the Christmas story that we are all invited into is God works in his, God's work in history is not limited by human failures or sins. And he works through ordinary people like you and I. Just as God used all kinds of people to bring his son into the world at Christmas, just as he's used all kinds of people throughout history and today, he uses all kinds, especially today, to accomplish his will on earth as it is in heaven. We've read about Jesus' ancestors, the eclectic bunch that they were. You yourself may have a, an interesting genealogy. Some good, some bad. It may bring up different emotions in you. But there is also a choice that you get to play. And that choice is, will you be a good ancestor? In, new, in an in new life in Jesus, there is a place for you in this story. And that starts at Christmas. So, we all have a past that we can be confident in that God will use for good. We have a God whose timing has been faithful throughout the generations. As we look to respond in a moment, I just want to ask you these questions. Do you need a reset this evening? to have faith in God's timing for your life. To let go of the control and trust that the God of the universe has you in his hands. And do you need to step into the freedom and new life that is an offer to you in this story? To not let your genealogy hold you back, but know that God uses it. God may take his time but he always keeps his word. There is a place for you in this story. Amen.